slave even though the bars are not there. All right? If they are in debt bondage all right, and owing money, that in itself is a form of slavery, just like um, locking a door and not letting them out. So if, if, and one of the real areas here that are a problem is because you could be brought into sex slavery at age, average age, uh, 12, that means at 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, you could be brought into sex slavery and be held as a slave, all right, through 21, 22, 23, 24, when people say, well, she had a cell phone, she was on the street, all right, this couldn't be trafficking because she could walk away at any time. My goodness, not so. All right. Not only do you have a dependence and a fear and a threat, all right, uh, so people have to understand that the definition is important because it's important to understand that there are different means of capturing and holding a person, and it really depends on what causes that person fear. But, but what problem is that your organization is? I'm sorry? Oh, I don't want I to do that. Please, your, please. It'd be interesting the Center for Democracy. Okay, yeah. I do have a you definition that you were using, or were you just trying no, to figure out how? I'm, I, because of so many definitions, I, because I work, uh, I'm focused in Saudi Arabia. And there are lots of child marriages in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. You know, where people have no choice, fathers sell them. And we are focusing in that. I engage people in the social media in terms of child Bright, marriage. Bright sales are definitely. Yes. All right. and, and so child, uh, I mean, child marriage is definitely a yoga top by, by, you all would be with that. Sold into marriage, absolutely. Yes. Yes. Okay. Held, held involuntarily. Yes. yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, thank you. Right. How it gets defined, though, is how it's getting funded. And I, we have an initiative right now to look at prevalence, and this is where Tara and I might slightly disagree because I think that um, some people have used technical uh, interpretations of that definition to constrain it. And so hence you get a number like the profitability is 32 billion, when that's only on 2.5 of forced labor, uh, government forced labor, and technical uh, interpretation of that definition, when we think the number is more like 250 billion, and it's an old number, and even the White House used the 32 billion, and it's wrong. Um, and We're talking about the profit from, from slavery, slavery internationally. So I saw a hand in the back, all the way in the back. First. Right, right in the middle in the back there was first hand up. Hello, my name is Mauritius Weifels. I'm a Dutch corporate lawyer with the Middle East in practice and also a chair of small NGO for the promotion of the rule of law in the Middle East. I have two questions. One, in the Gulf Operation Council countries, that's the, the Gulf, uh, that's the, the oil rich countries in the. the Speak Gulf. a little slower, please. Sorry, so the others the, can understand. The, oh, I'm fine, thank you. Um, in the, the Gulf Cooperation Council countries in the Persian Gulf, uh, the traffic is basically institutionalized. I mean, uh, although the law formally says other things, it is standard practice that people are deprived of their passport Question. and lockdown. Do you have any policy towards those countries? Yeah. That's well, one. And the second question is, that I apologize if this came up in the beginning because that was a few minutes late. Do you have any rational explanation as to why in your formidable company there's not a single man? Yes. Oh, okay. All right, we'll be here after this. Well, let me deal with the Middle East. That, that is on our radar screen for labor as a person who's been going to places like Qatar for 30 years, over 30 years, where you have institutionalized forced labor. Or, or You have to be careful here because there is valid reason for migration to those countries, right? And, and, but there are also people who are trafficked and are indentured, engaged in, in indentured servitude or are slaves. Um, we have an outreach now trying to drop teens into those by a number of NGOs to educate and to provide ways to legitimize the activity. So when you're bringing Burmese into Qatar to build for the World Cup in 20 whatever it is, how are you doing that and how are you paying them? So we set up direct pay. My, my idea is that we direct pay back in the home country. So we're just in the early stages of looking at the labor, the institutionalized labor issues we have in the Middle East. And I use Qatar because Sheikh Moza was trying to, she put together a foundation, was going to help in that area. It's been a slow start, but we're beginning to, 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 to take some action. If you want to talk about that in more detail, country by country, I'll talk to you afterwards. But I, okay, think that's why, I think that's why your idea of getting the corporations involved is important because 
We can't do a lot outside of our, our own corporation, but if we have zero tolerance, make it clear what our standards and policies are that when we are doing business in those communities, we are at least not complicit. And I think that's an important start. That is an important start. This gentleman right here. Actually, no, can I answer that? Yes, I just of want to course say you from can. the prevention side where we don't have activities in the Middle East, but we are working to prevent people from the source countries, yes. including Myanmar, um, uh, especially Indonesia and the Philippines are major source areas. Um, so we're working on that end to help them to understand how to pick recruitment agencies that are more ethical and have a lower rate of exploitation of their, of their people when they send them abroad, um, and then also try to equip them with numbers that they can call if they're in a situation of exploitation, which is also really challenging because there aren't too many agencies to reach out to there. But that, and speaking of best practice, FSI, a manpower development uh, group that started in the UK and Burma, is working on ethical recruiting processes. And the Burmese now are a, a big, big migration of Burmese to, to Qatar for the construction. And I happen to think construction, along with fishing, is a huge industry for us to get after. Um, and they're working on that right now in terms of what kind of recruitment would be ethical. Right. Gentlemen. Yes, uh, Hisham Abdul from the World Bank Legal Department. So my question is in the statistics. I mean, what's the scale of the problem global wide and where are the regions you know, who are most affected? And you mentioned 100,000 uh, people in the U.S. What is the... U.S. citizens. Citizen. Not 100,000 people in the U.S., just U.S. citizens is the 100,000. So what is the proportion, for example, the division between forced labor and forced sex? How many are in percentage wise? I just I want to get a sense of that. Okay. Well, I can give you what the, what's out there. You want me to take sure, it? Sure. Go ahead. Uh, the, 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 the number that's frequently okay. used for those who come under the definition is 21 million or 27 million. Sure. And the 21 million breaks down to about 14 labor for uh, sex. Uh, and, and then the remaining is government-compelled uh, uh, slavery. So that's about how it breaks down. Now, that's what's out there. There are numbers that are 27 million. There are numbers that include India that add 15. There are all sorts of numbers. One of the projects we have underway this summer is to get at a prevalence number that makes a little bit more sense. But so much is underground that we have to begin to do some, some countrywide surveys and we have an idea about doing that. Same with the profitability issue. The profitability has only been on the two and a half to three million of, of um, forced labor by governments. And we know if we just extrapolate that to 2005, we get to 250 million. I think it's going to be a half a trillion. So that gives you a framework. We've got people this summer that are starting to look at those numbers to see what we can do to get a better sense of what the prevalence is. But that gives you a range. It's great. You, so um, I have, let's do middle on this side. Who's got the mic? Oh, good. Hi, my name is Melvin Wong. I'm with Justice Ventures International, and we're in Beijing working with migrant workers and trafficking victims. And um, I'm encouraged to hear about all this abolitionism. I'm sorry, where are you based? Well, the organization is based in D.C., but I'll be in Beijing. Beijing. Um, working with migrant workers and trafficking victims. And I was wondering um, how much of this fight against human trafficking should now be focused on also the rest restoration of victims because if there's not enough safe houses um, and services, I think the people who are free are likely to go back to what they know. I think that's absolutely true. I'm going to make that an easy answer because there's so much to discuss. Anybody who wants to can join in. All right. But the answer is we are desperate for that kind of resource. You are 100% right that we don't have beds. If I told you in the United States entirely how many beds there are for victims of trafficking or slavery, uh, I'd be, I'm frankly too embarrassed even to tell you. All right. But resources are crucial. Did you wanna, do you want to add anything to that, Anna, or from past point of view? Or? You don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it is, it's, um, I just want to put it out there is please invest um, in victim services because that's what we need so we can have enough bed for all these victims. Right. And also like you know if you invest in a, in a victim or a survivor like you're worried about them getting back into the trafficking again so if you invest in a victim they can have a better job, better education and they won't be into trafficking because they can't go home. 
they're, they're, they either left home for a reason and became vulnerable, couldn't earn a living for themselves or their family and became vulnerable, or were sold. There's no hope and language. So, Rashna, do you have something? Yeah, I was thinking that you're right, but uh, it's a bit strange that in this domain that you're planning to put an international hotline system. I think an institutional organization should take the lead, and maybe even the World Justice Project, to create a platform where we can have these donors and those willing to get resources can come together. Because uh, it's uh, a lot of people I met here who are willing to do something, but they don't know which door to type, to knock. Uh, whereas uh, there are some people who are willing to give money, but there needs to be a platform. For example, in other sectors like the environment sector, you do have uh, organizations specialized who do the mobilization. But in this domain, maybe it's new, and maybe the World Justice Project can do something about it. Or someone who's sitting in this room who would like to begin that Take the lead. We'd support the yeah. idea very much. Uh, someone is holding a mic. Who's in charge of passing the mic? Let's get, okay, let's get some mic control here. Okay, so right here, and then, and then to the back. Mine is not a question, but uh, maybe a response to what he said. Because in the Philippines, uh, I, I'm from Dawn, the Development Action for Women Network, and we assist victims of trafficking. And um, we provide them with uh, alternative livelihoods and uh, skills training so that uh, we can also help them, uh, I mean, we can prevent them from being with traffic. And uh, then through these interventions, they they, they become survivors and now they're advocates. So uh, these uh, women now are helping us in our campaign against uh, trafficking. So I think it's very important to to look at the interventions that we could give to victims of trafficking. Thank uh, you. Yeah, thank you. This is like, this is like a, a, a key issue for the development of the hotline and everything we do. If we don't have places for victims to get support, um, it, it makes the hotline a almost ineffective. So we have to work on this. And even the case I mentioned of the be free, calling in on, or texting in, when the immediate, and we have networks all over the United States for Polaris. Um, they said it was going to take two hours to get there. And the victim is saying, two hours? This is going to be over in two hours. you got to get here now. Are you kidding me? The pimp's next door. I'm here. Come get me. And so we, we were able to scramble to two or three other networks before we were able to get her out of there. But the point is, that's in a well-developed area where we have lots of resources. Um, where you don't, it's very difficult. And we need a fund to be able to go after this. So um, I, I would actually also like to speak to reintegration. I think that it's there's a need for money. There's a need for shelters. There's certainly a need for shelters that cater to men in countries where um, trafficking of men is happening. But I think that there also needs to be a strengthening of reintegration services. Because what's interesting is research just came out in Southeast Asia that showed that um, people who had been trafficked were no more knowledgeable about what trafficking was than people who hadn't been trafficked. Most of them chalk it up to bad luck, right? Because a lot of people are leaving their communities, a lot of people are going for work, they just had a really bad experience. And chances are that the same reasons that, you know, lack of food security, lack of whatever, that they left home to begin with are still there. So they're going to have to go again. So I think what we also need to do is, you know, these, these first providers, these people who are identifying individuals as victims, we need to increase that for sure. Um, but there also needs to be awareness raising to people that have been rescued, right? And this is, this is if you make the decision to migrate again, you may decide not to migrate again, many people do. But if you make the decision to migrate again, these are the resources that are available to you. This is, you know, um, I, think, I think that that's something that can be similar to working with the business sector and, and getting things. That can be mainstreamed. That can be brought in at pretty low cost. It's just about um, adding things to training and to reintegration practices. One of the things we saw in Cambodia that I thought was interesting is we went, I, I think we saw like 22, I took a group of kids in February when we went to Southeast Asia. We went to 22 NGOs, and most of them that were providing services to victims in um, group homes where they could get services, but a couple of them were doing it on the street. And that was the most interesting thing to me because they were saying, look, she was, she was, in sex, she was sex trafficked, but she's in an abusive relationship still right now. She's no longer in the traffic. We have to help her live in the community. 
So we visited two NGOs who were focused on servicing victims in their current homes and in their current environments so that it, it recognized the reality of their lives rather than in a group home where reintegration becomes more difficult. And I think that's something that we have to begin. I, I thought that was a really great approach. It's that's something we have to begin to Very do. realistic approach. So a lot of you are involved in other areas where you know the importance of collaboration. I'm asking Marilyn to give a, a short synopsis of a very important program that she's involved in in Minnesota, which I think is scalable any place. Well, great. As we got into this on a global scale and a national scale, we started to realize that the real progress is happening community by community. And so we helped to fund the Women's Foundation of Minnesota. We created a program called Minnesota <coughs> Girls Are Not For Sale. We started with a Freedom Here and Now conference to which we invited over 100 stakeholders that represented advocates, funders, law enforcement, elected officials, faith community, medical community, and businesses that we were all convened to put input into the initiative. It's a five-year plan, $4 million initiative. So far, the advocacy has resulted in changing the laws in Minnesota. The safe harbor law is the law which um, says that children who are trafficked are not treated as victims. Um, out, of the, out of the funding, we've gone to existing agencies rather than starting new agencies and asked, done an RFP, um, and sometimes a couple of agencies have gone together to, to create best practices models of how to um, reintegrate some of these, many of the girls in the U.S. are on drugs and there's, so it isn't just, they can't just go into a regular shelter. Even some of our domestic abuse shelters, it doesn't work. They have different problems. So they need dedicated space. So this is a, a community-wide collaborative effort to address the problem. Very important that we have the mayors were there. We had legislators there. Um, if you can convene the community around the issue and raise the awareness, then each of the different platforms can work against its, with its own population, but they're meeting regularly, and they're quite proud of the fact. As a matter of fact, I, I had a, a communication that I brought from one of the um, county attorneys, because we've had so many prosecutions um, that have come out of this, and he said, there are those who are starting to think that, this has, that the amount of trafficking has increased so dramatically. And he said that really isn't the case. The fact is that for the first time, our entire state is aware of this issue. The courts are willing to participate, and the, um, and the legal enforcement, the, the police departments are training people what to do, how to treat the perpetrator, how to treat the Johns, how to treat the victims, so that we have um, made an enormous amount of progress, really, in about a year and a half. Yes. It's, it's absolutely a community model. I saw some hands who, great. I only see a hand, I don't see a person, so. <laughs> uh, so my name, Yara, from Cambodia. Yes. yes, so let me explore my English, it's not good, so. Uh, so I heard a lot of like raising awareness and I saw in Cambodia they have like uh, on TV exhibition like almost every year and number <coughs> of NGO, local NGO working like human trafficking a lot. But the problem is in my country people unaware of the protocols to follow when they saw the potential of the victim on the street. So even people sometimes they know about the hotline. They knew maybe some some NGO or we should go to authority. But the problem is that people don't know how to react, how, how or where, or what should they do when they see people like trafficking like that? So how do you encounter this? Yeah. Internationally, anybody want to take that? Well, you raised a huge issue because I talked about a global hotline, and let me get into a detail related to that region. Um, some of the hotlines are sponsored by governments in that region. I'll take Thailand. To for a minute. Um, and if you call the hotline that's sponsored by the Thai government, 
By, as a requirement, you are interned in an internment camp and you are deported. And in many cases, those internment camps are run by corrupt police officers who then traffic you. I mean, that, that, there is a whole series. If you go down and you talk to um, the, the, in the fishing industry down there, you hear a lot of these stories. So we're having to sort out the hotline idea is not a perfect one, and it's going to take some time because the mapping process is not only to find out what hotlines exist, but what hotlines are effective and can be trusted. And then we get into the dilemma of, and I was going to raise this before this ended anyways, corruption. Um, and if you have corrupt law enforcement, you get into how do you react. And Cambodia is the place where IGM took action, right, in Cambodia. And, 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 and you might want to speak to this, Terry, because this is your, your space. Um, and increasingly, the government has tied their hands in how they go in because, um, because the local law enforcement was so corrupt, they decided to, they went in with wires and tried to do interdiction on their own, and now they're being constrained. Do you want to pick up on that? Um, actually, before picking up on, on the government, I, I'd like to say that um, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that awareness levels are high because that's what our research is showing. MTV Exit has been in Cambodia since 2008, and we do large door-to-door uh, -door surveys to inform um, <coughs> where we're measuring levels of knowledge, attitude, and intended practice. And that informs the kinds of messages that we're relaying to the audience. Now, when we first started doing this, awareness levels, just understanding what trafficking was, incredibly low. Now, from a media perspective, you can only pack so much in information into an intervention, right? So we have to start with, what is trafficking? Um, now, we're at a point in Cambodia and in many countries in, uh, across Southeast Asia where we work, um, excluding the Philippines, actually, um, where levels, uh, levels of awareness of trafficking are, are quite high, they're above average, and they're certainly above other regions where we but work. But the but question, no, 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 yeah, I'm let's not, get to let the question. Get to it. Right. Um, so where we are now is the economics term that you used, a point to make a change? Inflection. Inflection, Inflection thank you. Point. Um, so we're there now, levels of awareness are there, and now is the time to promote direct behavior change and social actions, right? So now we know that Cambodians know what trafficking is, they've, they've seen it, they understand it. Now it's about really targeted um, messages about exactly what people can do beyond calling a number or understanding in Cambodia where there are 15 numbers, which number to yes, call when. Yeah. So I think the question is, which we may not be able to answer, but the question was quite specific. What's, what's a victim to do in Cambodia today? It really depends on who they are. If, it's, if they're a man or a woman or Let's a child. Let's take a woman. And they're exploited within Cambodia? Yes. As a sex trafficking victim? Yes. Um, then I would call, have them call um, Transitions Global. Okay. Yeah. Or IJM. Or IJM. I, am, I, I Honestly, this is a perfect case of the problem that we've got in this. Is there are so many hotlines in Cambodia that we've mapped, Absolutely. most of which can't be used. All right, but we're talking about what we can do, all right, at the moment, because I think she was asking very specifically. And so IJM or Transitions Global. OK. And um, we can give you, if you would like, because I'm not quite sure if you are an NGO. Are you working? What, what are you doing in Cambodia? No, I'm working like land. Uh, I'm working only land and housing issue, but I am really observed. That yes. The question is, it's not about the whole land. It's not about like MTV exists, because the, so many people attend the concert, and many people, they know the whole land. But the thing is that we are people, local people, we saw that. We don't know how to react if we see this situation. Well, one, one thing, I mean, we have to get government intervention as well. And I think if the problem in Cambodia is quite um, difficult because government is not necessarily, your first responder is not somebody that you can necessarily trust at the moment. But I think the two organizations we gave you are your best bet right now until we get more. The other thing that's helping in Cambodia is under the U.S. law now, prosecution of Americans doing the sex tourism, which became a big part of Cambodia. Americans, New Zealand, Australians, and some of the first prosecutions have occurred. And I think that's going to help us with Cambodia, too. All right, so we're going to take two more questions from the floor, and then I'm going to ask my panel to think of the one thing that we haven't covered that they really want to share. It's going to be about three sentences each or so. So two questions, one here. Uh, Kimberly, I'm Kimberly Conway, I'm a filmmaker from Boston. And my question is, in terms of laws, both are on the books, regionally, internationally, what's being done to strengthen them, and going after 
making some really huge convictions and prosecutions of these perpetrators. All right, without me answering, I will, but if you want to say something oh, here. It, it's, it's back to what I mentioned before, that we need to protect them because the girls are really low, uh, young, the children are terribly worried. They've been threatened, um, their families are threatened, so they need perhaps to have some anonymity, they have to have psychological support. So there are organizations that actually can work with them and help them to be willing to testify. But in the, the U.S., um, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, which comes from the State Department and which does three tiers of recognition of the uh, effort being and, and the success, the, 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 how each of the countries, what's the word I'm looking for, how, the, how much enforcement is taking place and how the relative performance against trafficking of the three tiers, the first being the best, that, um, that the, in each of those different countries there's different responses that, in terms of the um, victims being willing to testify. So the TIP report came out this last year and that was the major thrust was that we should be having many more prosecutions, that there's a willingness in many cases to prosecute, there's a difficulty of getting the victims to actually testify, and that's something that we need a lot of help. So aligning law, aligning law, we have a Palermo protocol, all right, which sets forth some provisions for defining trafficking and, and some enforcement. But uh, in the United States right now, we've, we have uh, begun to answer that question, not only on the federal level of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, but right as we speak, we're considering a uniform law for, in which every state will each have a baseline law that's identical, and some states will opt all right, to have more stringent laws, Illinois and Florida and, and New York and Texas. There are a number of states that are taking a much stronger position, much uh, uh, defined trafficking in a way that the prosecutors can get at it, and penalties much more in line with the crime. And, and, and expungement of conviction if you were a victim at the time you were convicted of a crime, many issues. But when we go internationally, we were talking about that at our, uh, <coughs> at our incubator project uh, to, to try and start to take a look at laws internationally and see you know, who would help figure out where uh, those laws could be approved. But at the end of the day, it's really about training the first responders and the enforcement folks eliminating the corruption and, uh, and enforcing the law. And then I must say something that hasn't come up here at all, and that's uh, the, the large community that talks about why aren't the buyers, the Johns, being prosecuted? Why is it just um, the woman being accused of prostitution? So there is a, there are, a two-sided conversation in the sense that, or two prongs, two paths, one end demanding entirely, okay? And the other is prosecute the buyer. Right, so prosecute the seller of the buyer. I know, I'm the itching. Okay. I'd really like to speak to Southeast Asia. And um, even though on the ground implementation, there's a, there, we're facing a lot of challenges with government engagement. But nationally, and certainly at the legal and policy level, there have been great strides forward in the past few years. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to name a few specifics. In January of, um, uh, I think it was 2012 could be wrong, could be 2011, Vietnam for the first time changed their law where they recognized internal trafficking mm -hmm. and trafficking of men, which was fantastic. Now the thing that needs to follow is all of the, you know, the, everyone needs to be trained to what that means, but we were able to go in and, um, and make the first ever program about men who are being trafficked to China. Um, really exciting. The Philippines this year updated their law, um, which uh, one element of it that's interesting from a prosecution perspective and from a media perspective is that it enables the media to advertise perpetrators who are in trial. So it's acknowledging the fact that they're not getting a lot of convictions, but they still want people to be aware of the individuals or the agencies that have been accused of this. Very interesting. Um, Myanmar. The only reason we were able to do a public event there is because they changed their laws and last year they acknowledged forced labor within Myanmar. Very exciting. They were lifted from tier three to tier two watch list. We were able to go in and do an event and their government is very committed to this issue. Um, and China 
Also, as of this year, the government has finally started talking about cross-border trafficking of people into China, and it's been, of course, around the, uh, within, under the, you know, we've repatriated 2,000 plus women this year alone, um, and as a result, uh, we actually have just produced a program about this that will be launching this year. But um, really, really exciting strides forward are, are happening in Southeast Asia. I, I promised one question, then we're going to start, then we're going to start with Jean on final statements. I'm just warning, we're going to go this way, and those final statements will be about uh, less than a minute each. A minute is a long time, ladies. All right, so I saw this lady up in front has had her hand up since the very beginning. I'm sorry, sir. But you can come, but you can come up to us afterwards. Hi, my name is Caitlin Fisher. I, I live and work in Brazil on a gender justice project that uses football um, as a tool. And as you know, we have the World Cup next year. Yeah, we're in on that. Olympics 2016. But you know, one of, and you know, the issue of human trafficking on these big mega sporting events is absolutely enormous. Um, Question. So yeah, thinking about leveraging these events for yeah. visibility. How thoughts on this? Yes. Yeah. There are current initiatives by Humanity United trying to drop in teams both to Qatar and to Brazil. Um, they tried in South, in, in, in South Africa um, and, and tried to do some interventions. Very difficult. Learned a lot of lessons. The answer is we're trying. It's a huge right, problem. So let me give you another suggestion. We have the Attorney General of Indiana, all right, which uh, did quite a bit of work around our Super Bowl. Huge issue: buses and bus loads of young girls. All right. New Orleans followed that, not so good, all right, but um, we have the next Super Bowl in New Jersey and they're already talking to us. So we have at least a protocol for our Super Bowls, which is not as extraordinarily active, all right, uh, but it is a beginning. And then the other thing is uh, television, right, around big, the, what we want to look at is it's extremely expensive. No NGO is going to be able to buy space. But the corporations who are buying space, all right, on these huge television advertisement initiatives, they could be looking to use one of their stars to say a little bit like uh, Minnesota girls aren't for sale, all right, that, that message, all right, so there's that possibility. But we could put you in touch as a starter and then we want to learn from you. I think you need to get the training materials into all the hotels because if every hotel and every right. motel in the area has the materials that's that is absolutely a very powerful place to address this problem back to government collaboration and and actually showing up when and they receive the, the call the world, when when the world cup or the super bowl come the federation comes in and pulls all the hotels together they manage pricing they manage all sorts of things the allocation of rooms you can actually just say we're going to we want this to be a part of that policy and I think it would be very helpful to have if you have the training of materials and you can access that. So unfortunately, we've hit our Just one other rule to go. I'm going to give you an end. Okay. Okay, and you can kind of check <laughs> that in. No, I'm mean, right. uh, uh, The other thing is that in a couple of locations, they've set up temporary hotlines and temporary service providers. You should be working with local NGOs to do that for your event, all right? And then to get a hotline up and running. A couple of things. I started off by saying that there's an inflection point, and that inflection point uh, needs all of you. It means we need NGOs, we need civil society, we need businesses, we need students, we need everybody engaged. So I would encourage you to leave here to do something and to, to be involved. Um, I, I want to emphasize something Marilyn emphasized. What I have seen everywhere that I participate in the world so far is when it's community-based and down in the trenches is when we have the biggest impact in terms of getting the message out, in terms of delivering services, and I think that's really important. Prosecutions at the community level, back to the question about legislation. Um, in, Fair, in Fairfax, Virginia, second highest median income county in the United States, last year because of community-based activism, we went from zero to 16 um, convictions for human trafficking. And, and so again, community-based. And finally, my last thing, going from the private sector to the public sector is money. If we're going to do, I mean, just a, a few simple hotlines are going to cost us $20 million, and then we got to maintain them. We're going to have to have a fund where we get uh, service provision, where we recruit um, and train local law enforcement, um, where we run hotlines. So there's, 
uh, incredible power of networks, the power of technology, power of all sorts of things, but the power of money is huge. And we're going to have to continue to raise resources. Thanks, Jean. Emma, the one thing that you didn't have a chance to talk about, so you could do it as your final statement or not, is if there's, there are a couple of things that you wanted to say were not working so that we wouldn't do them. So, all right, if you have that, that's fine, but whatever you want to say, final statement. Well, I, actually, I agree with you. It's just we need all of you. We need the government, the community, society to do all this work to stop or prevent human trafficking. And uh, all, we all know that human trafficking, we have to look at the grassroots of human, uh, how, I mean, we have to look at the grassroots of why people are being trafficked, being in poverty. Like, you know, we have to work together as, you know, collaborative. We have to, um, in like Southeast Asia country, like I'm from there, and, you know, like provide a better education, better job for, you know, people in each country to prevent people migrating to other country and being exploited. Marilyn? Two simple things. First, um, something that I think we should carry with us is that the great American psychiatrist, uh, Carl Manager, said that what is done to our children, they will do to the world. What is done to our children, they will do to the world. This is really a call to action for all of us. And then the second is, is a poem. Um, it's something that's guided me over and over when I fought for women's rights and minority rights, and now uh, the human rights of these people. And it's a poem by Edwin Markham, and I think it could be a sub-theme for everything that we've heard in the last three days. It goes like this. He drew a circle and left me out. Heretic rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I, had the wit to win. We drew a bigger circle and drew him in. I've been so impressed this last three days. There's not a person here who's not drawing bigger circles. And I've just been very grateful to be part of all this. And I say thank you to you for thank doing you. me. Definitely. Okay, Tara. I have to follow that. A song, maybe. <laughs> I can't do a dance in general. Um, uh, I actually just want to put a pitch for working with youth directly. Uh, they're the next generation of all of the influencers, the business leaders, the artists, the celebrities. I mean, these are all of the people that ultimately push this issue and all the issues that we all hold dear to us uh, to the forefront of societal discourse and really make change happen. Um, so I'm a strong proponent of youth engagement and getting them involved in having their voices in your boardrooms and at the table and in your strategic planning. Um, and generating the very materials that we want to take out for the community-based targeted messaging. Um, and the other thing I want to say is that uh, MTV Exit, all of our materials, educational, short form, long form, uh, they're at mtvexit.org, free for distribution, take my card, visit. Um, I definitely want to send you all the materials that you need to do any kind of awareness raising in your workplaces, in your communities, showing your family a really great music video that talks about trafficking. Uh, so yeah, be in touch. Yeah, I have a last word that a new program that the, our government is working on. It's the Circular Migration Program. Currently, we have it with Canada and France, where we have legalized migration. Where, uh, we send uh, Russians to France uh, and Canada. They recruit them, even train them in uh, 61 identified areas. And after working for three months to two years, they come back in the country. And in some uh, programs, they have been given the same money to set up their own business in the country. So this sort of circular migration, it helps, uh, it's both way, win-win for both countries. But the real challenge is for uh, France and uh, Canadian companies to recruit the emotions and then uh, send them back. Because very low demand, there is a brief, I don't know, it's a preference, should be towards legal migration. And then there's another program, regional program that we are doing, where it's called the ABEI, Accelerated Program of Economic Integration, where was, uh, it, uh, currently there's Mauritius stations, Malawi, Botswana, and Zambia, where there is circular migration, talent mobility for professional uh, skilled workers, 
and this also is uh, helps uh, circular migration within these countries and of course all other African countries are welcome to join in the program. Okay. That's spectacular and just as a close I want to thank the audience and the, and the superstar panel. I hope that we've given you some examples that will start you in another direction or if it's not your area that you can go home and start to talk about people who should be calling us and looking us up. And remember that every single person that you are with from this moment forward, these words, slavery, human trafficking, in your town, next to your house, in your McDonald's, everywhere, everywhere, you need to be able to do your own awareness. AmericanFire.org slash trafficking, our toolkits, our videos, and it is just all about collaboration. Please don't go home and reinvent the wheel. We want you to just start way up here and then improve what we've got. All of us want to give you what we have, all right, and then have you use it and then improve it. And so again, thank you for your attention. You've been fabulous. Thank you.